Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our December Meet the VC. We have an amazing day planned for you today with a fantastic VC, Michael Mizrahi, and our amazing host today, who will be David Moore. But before we get started, just a couple quick touch bases. I'm your host. My name is Gina Longmire. I started with early growth back in 2013. I left briefly and came back in March of 2021 to help host these amazing webinars. My background is mostly in events, recently virtual events and backend production. For those of you that are new to us, our webinar runs about 40 to 60 minutes long, depending on our question and answer period. You can feel free to ask your questions at any time using the question and answer panel. We will get to them as soon as we, we can and towards the end of the presentation. But during the day, feel free to chat with each other, you know, in the chat bar right now, if you'd like to drop your name, where you're from, you know, any areas of interest, your organization, we encourage you to do so, you know, get to know each other and engage throughout the presentation. And let us know where you're dialing in from today. As usual, the event will be recorded. Once this is over, we'll have it uploaded to our Early Grow YouTube channel. So feel free to pop on if you have to leave early to see the end of it or share it with your friends. About Early Growth. Again, for those of you that are new, Early Growth is a fantastic company that takes you from startup to exit. Early Growth is your company's one-stop shop for essential business services at every stage. From CFOs and strategic finance to accounting and human resources, we get your back office services done so that what you can focus on is the important thing, which is growing your business. Here's just a couple of the clients that we work with and that we've helped throughout the years. We have over 5,000 clients that depend on early growth. As kind of our goal, you know, what we want to deliver to you is our peace of mind. We want to help protect your profitability and we want to be your partners as you continue to grow your business. And much like we want to be your partner, we wouldn't be anything with our partners. Some of, oops, excuse me, some of our partners are First Republic and Trinet. Unfortunately, they are unable to be here today, but we work very closely with these groups as well as many others. If there's a specific area of interest, whether it's HR and payroll, banking, legal, again, please let us know in the chat. And what we can do is get back to you with some of our top partners who can help assist you in these areas. Right now, as we head into the end of the year, we know that tax season is coming up. And right now we have a special promotion for you where you can get $500 off your 21 tax preparation. All you have to do is go to www.earlygrowth.com backslash tax promo and enter in your information. This does end at the end of the month. So we encourage you to hurry up and head out there. We have a couple poll questions for you guys today. One is, are you fundraising? The next is, are you interested in venture capital? And finally, how are you feeling going into 2022? Do you have you know, higher expectations coming off 2021? Are you hesitant? Are you still wondering? We encourage you to put these answers and any other questions you may have, again, in the chat box and our host and our VC will get back to you with some answers. And with that, I'd like to bring up David Moore. He is going to be today's moderator. David is a business development manager for early growth. He was an HR employee benefits consultant for Trina for four years, and he works in finance, HR, and risk consultants for early growth slash, excuse me, slash Escalon, and he's been with us for a little under a year. So with that, I'm going to ask David to come on screen and take over. Perfect. Thanks so much, Gina. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so hi everybody, it's nice to meet you. Uh, my name is David Moore, uh, like Gina had said, and uh, I'm located in our Southern California office. I'm in LA and um, I've been consulting for early growth Escalon for uh, a little under a year now. And um, I'm excited to be here and have a good conversation with uh, uh, our VC and uh, his name is Michael. So if we can go ahead and pull up his bio, I'd like to just make an introduction for him. Um, and then we'll invite him as well. Um, so today we have uh, Michael from Wavemaker. He is a uh, principal um, at the firm and originally born and raised uh, in LA. Uh, prior to Wavemaker, he was the VP of business development for Karma Group and has a uh, wealth of experience uh, over 10 years uh, with uh, digital media, investment banking, 
uh, venture capital and, and various private startups. Uh, some of his uh, areas of specialty include uh, M&A, uh, venture capital investing, operations strategy, uh, and valuation analysis as well. Uh, so I'll go ahead and invite him to uh, come off mute and come on camera and say hello to everybody. Hello. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, I know I just uh, went into a little bit of a bio for you, but if you'd like to maybe uh, echo some of your uh, more notable experiences or uh uh, history would love to to have you piggyback off that and introduce yourself. Sure. So, like you mentioned, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I feel like at this point, I'm kind of like a unicorn. There aren't many uh, original born and raised Los Angelinos. Born and raised in LA, went to USC after uh, undergrad. Immediately jumped into investment banking. I worked at a boutique shop out here in Santa Monica. Um, started off at the very bottom. And I think this speaks to, you know, a lot of who I am. It's just, you have to have that drive. So started off at the bottom, worked my way up. Uh, when I left, I was a senior associate. At that point, I was leading my own deals. Um, one of my favorite deals that I did was we sold TV Guide to CBS. And that was a pretty interesting deal where, you know, I, I actually led a lot of that and ended up speaking to the boards directly at CBS and Yahoo and DirecTV. I mean, that deal was a mess. But after doing investment banking and selling my soul for a little bit, I felt like I needed some more experience. And I jumped to the other side of the desk, working for startups in and around LA, you know, in various capacities, doing, you know, operations, finance, BD, corporate development, you know, just leveraging my experience and expertise um, for the startups. Um, at that point, um, after I did that for a little bit, my brother and I were at an inflection point and we thought, you know, now's the time to jump. So we both started our own uh, business called Karma. We were selling uh, new cars or primarily leasing new cars directly to consumers. We were, we were brokering. It was a really fun business to do. And uh, I learned a lot from it. And again, that's part of, you know, what I'm going to talk about today is that entrepreneurship journey. But I learned a lot from that business. And, you know, when that business sunset, part of it was due to COVID, part of it was other factors. Um, I rejoined the firm uh, WaveMaker where, you know, we are an early stage fund primarily focused on enterprise and deep tech startups. We are dual headquartered an office out here in LA where I sit, but we also have an office in Singapore and it's uh, been a fun ride since. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for, for that introduction and, you know, lending your time to, to us. Um, you know, we've got an interesting, uh, you know, looks like a diverse group of attendees. Some people are interested in getting into venture capital. Some are raising, some are entrepreneurs uh, in, at various stages. So um, something just for the audience as well, um, you know, feel free at any time to raise your hand or um, pose a question um, in the chat and Gina and myself will be, you know, kind of monitoring that and we'd love to um, have you involved. So feel free to um, interject at any time and, and would love to, um, to have you chime in. Uh, so with that said, uh, Michael, some things that we wanted to do was just kind of pick your brain uh, from uh, different areas within um, the venture capital uh, community and better understand your world and how we can partner with uh, early stage founders and entrepreneurs um, for a mutually beneficial relationship and, and really grow and, and develop. And so something that, you know, I'd like to kind of talk about is is, you know, what got you interested in transitioning to um, venture capital from Karma in the first place? You have a strong investment banking background. What um, piqued your interest about venture capital? Sure. So going back to, you know, the beginning of my career, part of what the thesis at this investment bank was that if we had our own venture fund, those portfolio companies could then become our clients. So at this investment bank called Seaman Associates, we started this venture fund, which was WaveMaker 2, really the first institutional fund that we created at WaveMaker. Mm -hmm. And I got exposure to the VC world and traditional path for investment bankers, you know, after they do either two or five years in investment banking, they go into PE or VC. So it was nice to get exposure to venture capital at the early stages. And, you know, what tried me back to VC was twofold. Number one is I really loved investment banking and I recommend investment banking for everyone. Yes, the stories are true. You do work like a ton of hours. 
it's, you know, you get beaten up every single day, both by, you know, your team members and the clients, et cetera. But the skill set you learn is invaluable. And it's skills that I take with me every single day. I live my life in Excel and PowerPoint. As sad mm-hmm. as that may be, I, I, I honestly do love it. So I, I love that always drive, always having to need, need to being on. And part of, you know, the nice thing about Karma was I made my own hours. And I did my own thing. But then I always missed waking up and seeing that phone light with 47 emails of which 40 of them I had to respond to right away or the world would have ended. That <laughs> mindset. So in venture capital kind of gets me back to that. Obviously, it's not as intense and you know demanding, but it does get me back to that. But the other thing about you know venture capital that's really interesting is that the reason why I got part of venture capital is like, I want to create the world I want to see for my kids, create that better environment. And VC allows me to place those bets where I think these founders and these business models will create a better world for the next generation. And that is really interesting for me. Like I, I want to be able to help the future. You know, that's my legacy that I invest, invested in something that took, got rid of all the carbon or, or in the world or alternative proteins, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, and I mean, uh, well, and if you ever, uh, you know, miss having 40 plus emails in the morning, um, I've got some I can delegate to you because uh, <laughs> I could use some help with mine. Um, but no, no, I'm just kidding. That's that's really interesting. So you um, in, in I'm kind of curious because you talked about the uh, skill set that you developed from the investment banking world. Is there anything kind of technical that you can kind of share with us that you learned that really helps you when you're evaluating opportunities or something that uh, an entrepreneur could fine tune within their own toolbox that you kind of technically grasped? Sure. So one thing that, again, I, I am a like investment banking fanatic and my wife is a graphic designer. So I'm going to caveat that as well. So I think one thing founders can really do well is make their materials look great and consistent. I go to restaurants or I go anywhere and I see formatting arrows, like it pops out of me, like no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think if you get the formatting right and get the look of the deck right, it's that you're showing me that you care about your business. You care about the little details because being a founder is worrying about the big things and the small things. So if you're able to like make sure that the comma is in the right spot or every sentence starts with a capital or every period, every uh, line in your PowerPoint ends with a period or doesn't, as long as you're consistent and the same throughout, that really shows me that you are caring. So I like to see that a lot. Um, The other benefit is, you know, obviously the financial side of things, building out a model and understanding that. And, you know, founders really understanding their numbers and being realistic is important. Obviously, everyone, you know, likes to see the graph go, you know, up and to the right at a, you know, near vertical angle. In the real world, that's not realistic. But if you show me real numbers with real proof and as to why this is happening or why you think this is it, I think that just really helps the conversation that, you know, you are a realist and it is okay to tell me I don't know or like this is a soft assumption and not something utterly crazy because then I just don't believe you and you lose all credibility to me. And then that, that just hurts you already. Yeah. So just making sure that you have uh, your due diligence items, uh, you know, ironed out before uh, meeting or having it organized um, in a way that, you know, can be articulated uh, with your business model and your finance model to really paint that picture for uh, the VC is what it sounds like you're, you're encouraging, yeah. um, which is really great, you know, feedback, especially because the demographic of an early stage uh, founder or, uh, you know, a potential portfolio company for you, um, that might be an area where they could use assistance in, in fine tuning. Can you tell us a little bit more about the demographic or the company stage or industry that you typically, um, that typically piques your interest uh, from your side? Sure. So we are primarily looking at the seed level. I know um, today the lines are blurring between pre-seed and seed and A, you know, these mega rounds are utterly crazy, but we are looking at the seed round. So that means like some traction, some revenue traction already. Um, you know, with customers and validation, um, areas of interest for us, you know, we do look at anything and everything. We do not really look at anything healthcare related. I'll caveat that. We do have a healthcare associated fund. Um, we don't really look at anything energy related. We do have an energy related fund. The, what we found out is that we just need to have people that are industry experts investing in those verticals for us to be successful. So that's what we did. Mm-hmm. But other than that, we look at, you know, media, direct to consumer, uh, me, myself, I look a lot in robotics, 
um, alternative meats, alternative proteins. Um, I do look at e-commerce. I think it's just very interesting, especially when you look at the like little niches that can be created within that. Mm -hmm. But those are the areas of focus for us right now. And obviously enterprise SaaS is, you know, something that everyone looks at and, you know, we'd like the repeatable numbers, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I think I, I'm tending to shy more and more away from that because it's not as, it's getting hard to be differentiated amongst all the competition out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically when you're making an investment, um, what does that investment size usually look like? What does your, that first check size usually look like? Sure. So it depends on whether or not we are leading or not leading the round, but our average check right now averages around half a million dollars. It can go up or down, like I said, depending for leading or not. Also depends, you know, we have ownership targets, like most VC funds have ownership targets um, that they have to hit for these companies. So when, you know, all the founders out there, when you're approaching VCs, you need to keep that in mind. You can't be approaching too many to lead or too few because they all have ownership goals. And if you only want to raise, you know, a million dollars and give up 10%, it's not very compelling to some VCs because they just have ownership goals that they have to hit, you know, for their LPs and the, mm -hmm. and the future rounds. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a, that's a, that's a good point. And just to kind of, you know, keep that on, on that line of thinking, what kind of factors influence uh, that and how can a founder um, catch uh, a VC at, at your stage's attention um, with those in terms of manipulate, not manipulating the numbers or the financials, but what are the factors that influence the ability to give up uh, a certain portion of, of ownership to kind of meet that target? You know, because sometimes it might feel like on the founder side or the entrepreneur side, it's kind of like uh, shopping in a grocery store, but nothing has a price tag on it. You've just are kind of taking a shot in the dark. What kind of guidance um, could you give for an industry type standard? If you're looking for uh, a certain amount of money, should you be prepared to lead with a percentage or how do you structure that? Sure. So it's, it's a really tough answer. You know, there is no generic answer to this, you know, and I hate this answer, but, you know, valuation is more art than science. You know, first off, you know, putting my, you know, founder hat on, it's really how much money do you need to get to that next level? And what are you willing to give up to get that money? Right. That's the, what you should be looking at. And really like, what is the minimum amount that you're willing to give up and the most amount of money you need? And that kind of factors in, but, you know, I don't, I think a lot of founders are struggling these days with like, oh my God, they read TechCrunch or these articles and they see some company raising at a 20 million pre-money. Why, mm -hmm. why can't I get that? And I think that's a mistake when people, founders look at that. It's valuation is not that important at the early stage per se, because you want to make sure that you build the business correctly and build it for growth. If you raise too little or too much, it just doesn't make sense. And the business won't ever take off correctly. And the yeah. competition will be right behind you. Um, you know, again, everyone thinks like their baby's the cutest or, you know, all of that. Yeah. There are four companies I guarantee you that are doing the exact same thing that you don't know about in America alone, let alone the world. Yeah. Obviously with our Southeast Asia presence, whenever we make an investment, I'm talking to my team there. Hey, have you seen any company in X vertical? And undoubtedly they always say we've seen four, right? <laughs> So like, and that's just four in Southeast Asia, forget about Europe and, you know, the rest of the world. So everyone's creating a very, very, various like-minded businesses. And it's not about valuation. It's more so getting to where you want to go next. Every mm -hmm. round, when you raise, you should be thinking about like, this is going to take me to that A round or that B round. And I need a minimum of $2 million to develop product or whatever it is to generate $2 million in revenue to get that A round. That's what, that's what the goal is. Not about like maximizing value valuation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, uh, you know, that really helps uh, paint a good picture and, uh, and address the question. Cause it's not so black and white. There is a little bit more of an art, uh, to it. Um, but for you personally, is there a kind of, um, ownership uh, amount that you kind of have from an expectation standpoint, or what are you striving for? Sure. So we typically, again, depending on we lead or not, it's between five to 10% with our first check. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the whole point is that ideally that the company continues to be successful and then we will defend that position every single time, you know, not every single time, but like through the A and B and so on, right? Because if you look at some of these mega companies that have gone public recently, 
you see their valuations and then you see like IVP owns 20% or some of these early venture funds that got an early own like 3%. Well, mm. 3%, it doesn't sound like a big number, but when you hit a $100 billion company and the company totally invested $3 million, that's a great, you know, great number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And, uh, and for uh, anybody who's raising money and, you know, you've been in this position before and you obviously work with early stage uh, founders all the time, um, the sentiment of feeling like, uh, you know, you're beating your head against a wall trying to uh, find the right path and the right solution on top of, you know, introducing your, you know, your idea or your product into the market. It can be a lot. Um, and sometimes patience uh, is truly a virtue in that sense. Um, what uh, comments or advice could you give uh, early stage founders who are, you know, going through that fundraising fundraising round and they're trying to be uh, patient and diligent, um, but also time is of the essence. <laughs> so what kind of um, feedback or thoughts do you have around that? Sure. I mean, it's tough to say for us it's really about engaging with the founders as early as possible it's you it's terrible to come to a vc when you have no cash and you know the places you're two minutes away from closing down so we always like to establish relationships early on and, and begin that conversation when you don't need the money and we can track your progress as as the company grows i think i'm uh, People think VCs have a very easy job, and obviously it is very nice. It is a great job. But we ourselves, VC is a business. We have our own investors. We do the same fundraising founders do, right? I, I need to approach, uh, you know, RLPs, fund to fund, et cetera, corporates every, you know, two years to raise our next fund. And they have the same questions, you know, they, they, that I ask you that they ask me. Right. What is your investment style? What, what do you guys like? You know, show me your numbers, show me your proof, et cetera. So we as VCs do the same thing that founders do. We are constantly fundraising. We are constantly getting rejected. I think the important thing is that we always have the right attitude. You know, you present the numbers truthfully or whatever you're presenting, you present it, in, it truthfully and you just build that relationship. A lot of what I've heard, you know, doing this is you need to start friend raising before you start fundraising. So build those friends, friendships, those networks first, and then you can start fundraising once you have that established. Mm -hmm. Almost like you're laying the foundation early on and you're not so much uh, cold calling a bunch of VCs asking for, uh, you know, shooting over pitch decks and asking for money and it becomes more of almost like a warm introduction or conversation uh, because those conversations and relationships have already been developed earlier on. Absolutely. And then part of it was like, obviously, you know, giving you guys a shout out early great growth has been a great partner for us and you know, companies that work with you guys, are, you know, we trust when someone has that stamp of approval from like an early growth, like that you've seen it, that you guys have blessed the numbers. And that makes us feel a little bit more comfortable knowing that, that, you know, we can come in and, you know, it's, it's a great, not a great company, but it could be a great company, but at least the numbers or the situation is at least right. Yeah. And that's one thing that I was going to say along those lines. And it kind of um, uh, segues into a question from uh, somebody from the, the audience, um, Harrison Rose, which I'll go ahead and pose that question to you in one second. But along those uh, lines, you know, on the early growth side, you know, we offer fractional um, uh, CFO services. And typically what I see is when we have an early stage company come to us, they have this concept and a rough idea of what the financials might look like, but sometimes it just takes sitting with a CFO on a fractional basis to one, review your financial model and business model, um, give a stamp of approval, but the majority of the time, we know what VCs want to see, and we can help organize this data and material in a way that uh, you can conceptualize it um, with confidence and uh, it just be delivered in a more professional, di digestible manner. Um, and that's kind of our wheelhouse. So we do work really well together in that sense. Um, but once you actually place an investment and now you have a portfolio company, can you talk a little bit about how you interface with the entrepreneurs in the portfolio companies in, in terms of your role um, and how engaged you are? What does that look like? Sure. So we can be as helpful or, you know, as step away as possible as the founder wants, right? Obviously at the end of the day, when we're investing at the early stage, we are betting on the founding team, right? And for them to execute on their vision. 
A lot of us at Wavemaker have been founders before. Our part, our found, our founder has founded two companies that he successfully exited. Our, you know, founder out in our Southeast Asia practice has founded like six companies, most of which that he's exited. Obviously, I founded my own company. So, like a lot of us, we understand the journey you're going through. We can, we understand the glass you're crawling through, the anguish that you're dealing with every single day. So we can be that conciliary for you to, you know, help guide you and, and be that little shoulder to cry on when you just need to cry and just that's all you want to do. So we are more than happy to be as involved or uninvolved as possible. The nice thing also about WaveMaker is that we do have a lot of engineering talent on our staff through WaveMaker Labs. So if and when, you know, you need help trying to do some technical work or just get, get some extra eyes on it, we do have personnel that can, you know, parachute in and take a look at the company and, you know, give our advice. Also, the nice thing of us being around for so long is we've built a lot of great relationships with other founders, other groups that, you know, if you are have building an e-commerce company and you're struggling with, you know, customer acquisition or something like that, we can point you in the right direction of, you know, an agency or another founder that's done it and then could just guide you and help you, you know, build that business up or at least answer that one question you may have. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And I think that that's something that's important for everybody to remember on the uh, on the founder side is, you know, there there's so much money out there. Uh, there are so many uh, uh, VCs out there and there are so many different resources that each one of them can offer um, and how to align with them and leverage them. Uh, I think one thing that you and I had talked about, um, you know, in the past was, uh, you know, not going to a VC when you're desperate for money, but instead um, being more proactive and having that foundation already kind of set. So you're not um, coming to them from this place of, you know, scare, scarcity and being frantic and trying to, to raise money, um, but instead being a little more proactive. Do you think maybe you could uh, shed some light on um, kind of that, that kind of that piece of it and that thought? Sure. So to get a hold of a VC is extremely easy. Usually our email is first name at, you know, whatever fund they're at or first dot last name at whatever fund they're at. Like my email is michael at wavemaker.bc. Anyone can email me. Um, but with that said is, can you, as you can imagine, I get probably a hundred plus emails a day of which I get 30 decks or 30 like approaches. And after a while, all these decks are starting to blur together. But what I think is imperative and how you stand out from the rest is a short email giving me some very quick tidbit on who you are and what's going on in your business. Like we just signed up 30, 30,000 customers or we have 30,000 paying customers, whatever it is, you know, since start two years, two months ago. And, and just those quick metrics and then dropping a note every once in a while. And that's it. Right. And also the nice thing that I like, the, another thing that founders have done really well. And one thing that I practice myself is I always ask, how can I be helpful to you? Right. Look, VCs, we're always looking for the next great deal. You might, you as a founder might have a friend that's also a founder that I need to be talking to you or some investor or some idea, or here's some cool report that maybe you haven't seen. Right. And sending me data also. So it's now like not just a one way relationship where you want something from me, but now you're giving me something also again, that's building that friendship, building that rapport with me where I want, I want to be helpful to you. I want to help you grow. I want to, you know, let you be successful. And look, if it's not wave maker, we work with, a ton of other VCs or we know what other VCs are looking for. And I can always point you in the right direction. Again, that's just building that friendship. Yeah. Yeah. I know that makes a lot of sense. That's really great feedback. Um, <clears throat> well, and even uh, when you're, you know, just starting a relationship uh, with a potential investor or whoever it is that's that's within your network. A lot of the times, um, there's a lot of buzz and wanting to understand um, your exit strategy. And I think when you're this early stage, um, it can be kind of hard to have a clearly defined exit strategy because you can't predict what's happening uh, in the near future. You know, five years from now let alone six months from now. So um, typically when you're raising money, uh, ROI is pretty critical, right? We're all in this to turn a profit. And that's a key concept for a venture capitalist. So from a fundraiser, or from a founder perspective, uh, what do you think about, um, you know, illustrating ROI and having a clearly defined exit strategy when really you're just trying to start? <laughs> sure. So, I mean, VC is a patient capitals game. 
right? Typically, we're investing at the early stage, like I said. We have most funds are structures that has a 10-year life cycle with two one-year extensions, so roughly 12-ish years, right? So we are willing to wait that long of a period for an exit, right? It's not always about getting a quick hit. It's more about getting the right, you know, exit for us. Mm -hmm. And no two exits are the same, but I'll say like this, you know, when an invest, when a potential company comes to us, having a clear sense of who those buyers are and what metrics will make them attractive, attractive for them to look at you is key. And, you know, like saying like, okay, if we're going to, right now we're doing 50,000 a month and we're going to grow to doing $1 million a month in Salesforce math, that means our company would be worth $36 million argument's sake at the series A level or whatever that number is. And at least having that knowledge shows us number one, that you know what you're talking about, you know, who, and also you know who your potential acquirers are or potential future investors. Most corporates at this point all have venture capital arms. And knowing how they uh, like to invest and knowing how they invest themselves is imperative to, you know, that next fundraising cycle and potentially that future exit. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and, and, and since we're, you know, talking about being so early stage and not having that completely ironed out, um, founders and entrepreneurs are, you know, looking at all different uh, outlets for, you know, capital um, and, uh, you know, incubators and accelerators are, uh, have a very large presence in the startup world. Um, and they structure their deals differently than a VC uh, does. So I'm kind of curious, what do you think of those other um, mediums or avenues that exist uh, to, to help you, you know, kind of get going in, in, in particularly accelerators and incubators, because I would imagine if they're coming to you, you know, series A, or they're looking for a seed investor, maybe they already have a relationship with an incubator and accelerator. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. So look, the answer is as a founder, go where you can get capital. D doesn't make a difference. Um, from a VC perspective, some of... Hello, everyone. We're so sorry. You've got to love the joys of technology. We somehow lost you, but we are back. So I'm turning it back over to our amazing host and VC. Thanks, Gina. Yeah, sorry about that, um, everybody, uh, and appreciate your, your patience. Um, so just to kind of um, pick up where we had left off, uh, we were talking about um, uh, incubators and accelerators and the different types of um, mediums that exist for founders who are raising. And Michael was just getting ready to, to tell us that you need to just get the capital. <laughs> Whoever's going to get you the capital, take that path. Um, and that's kind of where we hit our technical difficulty. So Michael, do you want to pick up from there? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, I mean, for founders, it is imperative that you always get that capital. You never know when that well is going to dry up. And, you know, if an accelerator or group is going to give you that capital, fantastic. Um, some of the benefits, you want to look at some of these accelerators. Some of them only offer like, hey, you're just sitting in a room and we're going to do like bring in a guest speaker every once in a while. And to me, I don't find that so valuable. But if there's an accelerator, let's say very focused on a segment that you're interested in, like, for example, out here in Los Angeles, if you are health tech-ish related, there's a great accelerator called the Cedar sinai accelerator i believe it's called and obviously they are able to plug you into obviously cedars but also other hospital groups throughout the country whereby the, it's going to take you from where you are today and accelerate you that much faster so if you are joining one of these accelerators groups make sure that they are giving you the right time of day and also giving you the right you know opening of the right doors right not just like hey you're gonna be part of this room everyone sit in the same classroom for one hour a week and give us 6% of your business and that's it, you know, and then you'll have like a little quote unquote certificate that you need to pay for at the end of the trial anyway. So to us, like we look at companies that get, go through accelerators, but it has to be value add. Otherwise, sometimes you get bad advice or they mess up your valuation or cap table that just makes it a lot harder. Uh, what do you mean by value add? Would like, like for now, like, open, like the hospital, like opening up doors to other hospital groups or, you know, for example, there's another uh, accelerator out here in LA called Yellow. It's a Snapchat accelerator, but they are there. They're teaching you how to use Snapchat better, open, a, open, the, open you up to a lot of their creators 
or you know give you inside access to use the platform in a different way that no one else has and that no one else has access to but you need to have years of experience or lots of capital to open up that special development within you know snapchat so again just finding the accelerator that matches your business model and that will actually open up doors for you and take you from zero to a hundred that much faster is imperative not just one that will make you sit in a you know classroom every week and give you a certificate at the end of the day yeah no no that 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 makes a lot of sense um and when and and typically after uh an investment has been made by you guys at the early stage whether you're leading or not um what kind of role would you guys play um or do you think avc should play in that next uh iteration of the business in that next round of funding because as things become a little more diluted and things become a little bit more complex um what are your thoughts on your role and responsibility in that next step well i think it, it, it's a twofold question number one i think the founders need to understand that when you take capital from a vc you have a fiduciary responsibility to us right it, it is a two-way relationship so you cannot just like because we didn't, let's say, follow on in the next round, or we're not emailing you every once in a while or pestering, like you still need to provide us with, you know, reports, year end status. Or if we email you and asking for an update, we do expect a timely response and, and a little bit of respect. I can't tell you the number of, you know, companies I've come across, both portfolio and not, that do not give us, you know, I don't want to say the respect, but at least, hey, you took our capital the very least answer our emails, provide us, you know, some insight into your business. Again, we're not asking for a ton, just a deck, you know, maybe hop on a call once a year, things like that. But, you know, for the founders that do want to use us correctly and leverage our expertise, our relationships, look, obviously you have all of our, you know, contact information, emails, you can always reach out to us. You know, I think it's a mistake when founders don't leverage their VCs because we see, number one, we see so many business models. We see so many different things. We can help you, you know, understand what's, changing in the overall landscape, you know, how the world is changing, how, you know, other investors are, are viewing that. You know, a ton of investors that will invest in your next round. And if you don't have talking to us, we can make that warm intro. Instead of you doing those cold emails, hey, I know the guy, he's invested in three of our portfolio companies at the next round. He, he likes what we see. Let me do this introduction. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing. We have, we know a lot of corporates that, you know, are looking potentially for solutions like yours. That's part of the reason why we invested in you. Ask us for introductions to corporate. Ask us if you know anyone at, you know, PayPal, Facebook, whatever, that could open up the door to be that customer. Look, mm -hmm. we want to see you succeed. And the only way we succeed, you know, is that when you succeed. So, like, we're here to help and we can't force you, but, like, use us. Yeah, no, uh, I, I hear you. And, um, and, and, you know, one thing that I'm kind of curious to get your feedback on, too, is if you know, because that's kind of the the common theme is we need an exit plan, we need an extra strategy, we need to, you know, do X amount um, in ROI. And what if, uh, maybe this is part of your investment thesis, but what happens if you have, uh, you know, a potential opportunity that could that could be viewed as more of like a cash flow investment, or maybe it's a, a company that's outside of your typical scope, you know, I know we talked about robotics and lab grown meats and deep tech, but would you ever consider or entertain the idea of maybe like a cash flow investment that isn't this unicorn of a business, but more of just, hey, this is a solid company. The founder doesn't want to sell. They don't want to be acquired. Uh, you know, what about that type of business? So me personally, I would be interested in that business, but at the fund level, sometimes we have our own rules that we're not allowed to invest in, you know, let's say LLCs that generate cash flow. Again, it's not that it's, there's nothing wrong with that business. It's just not something venture related. Look, we have our own objectives. We have our own investors. They expect a return. You know, they want that big multiple. They don't want us investing in something that will return, you know, 10% on their money every year. They could put that somewhere else. They want us to invest in something that will go from $1 to $50 or $1 to $100 or, or $2,000, right? And that's what they're more excited about and not those cash flow businesses. Again, nothing wrong with them, great businesses, but sometimes it's either a business or it's a venture business, right? And the business like I started, my business was not a venture, you know, relatable business, right? It was a cash flow business. I ran it for cash. It was great. But again, it would not attract venture funding. 
Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for, for giving that context. Um, and I know that uh, I want to be careful because we're only have 10 minutes left. Our little hiccup in technology, uh, you know, kind of cut us short. Um, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, it looks like uh, Yusuf has a question and he wants to know, can you provide VCs or corporates focused on entertainment media auditing focus? That was a question from the chat. Do you have any thoughts on that, Michael? Sure. So, I mean, there are plenty of VCs that look at that stuff. Like we look at media all the time. We're making less and less bets, honestly. When we do look at media, there are a few deal of uh, the other VC funds like Mount Sinai that looks at uh, media deals as well. I'm happy to take a look at it. You see, if you again, my email is michael at wavemaker.vc. And if I can point you in the right direction, great. But, um, you know, I think a lot of what's happening now is, again, depending if, if it's truly media and you're creating content or if it's auditing or something, you know, more sassy and businessy, it, it depends on who I, I can recommend you to. Awesome. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions that, um, that we had for you that were a little more technical focused um, around like valuations, for example. Um, so we had talked earlier that that's something that, that we do, right? Or a 409A valuation, but they're all different types of valuations that can be done. Maybe it's a valuation for, you know, gifting purposes. Maybe it's a 409A. Um, what are your thoughts on, or you had mentioned earlier that an incubator or an accelerator could, you know, mess up a company's valuation. Can you talk a little bit more to that? Because if a, an early stage founder is trying to identify the opportunity and evaluate their business at such an early stage what are the risks involved in that and how can you kind of mitigate any type of error and be as specific as possible when you're so early stage but need to have some kind of valuation in place sure so i mean there's two two things i want to say number one there are a lot of products out there like a safe or a convertible note that help with valuation concerns you know especially let's say you don't know what to price things at um, you can create a convertible note or a safe that, you know, kind of alleviates any of that like ambiguity or really alleviates ambiguity, but creates ambiguity later on around it. So like it kind of protects you and also protects the investors. Us personally, we don't like doing safes too much, but, you know, obviously the market has moved in that direction. Um, and also like, look, as a founder, you never want to do a down round. And sometimes when you go to these accelerators, things they require to give up 6% at some valuation. And when you graduate from that program and only, people are only willing to invest at you at a lower valuation than what you just took, you're doing a down round, meaning everyone's getting smushed, especially the founder, right? Because you can't just smush tech stars or one of these groups. So it, it does lead to that problem of like, if there is a difference in valuation between groups, you run that situation where you're going to have to go back to your existing investors and be like, hey, I don't know what happened. Not, I don't know what happened, but hey, this is the market. The market's talking. We're all taking a haircut and, you know, Unfortunately, it's either we all take a haircut or we don't take funding and the business closes, right? Mm -hmm. But hopefully this funding will take us to that next round. Again, not a bad thing to take a down round, but you just have to be cognizant, cognizant of it and think of your investors there. Yeah, but and you had said that, uh, you know, you typically don't want to or don't like to um, engage in convertible notes or convertible safe notes. Um, but that's kind of where it's uh, the industry is going. Why is that? Is that for lack of, uh, you know, confidence in evaluation for such an early stage company? So it just makes more sense. Or why do you not want to do it? But we kind of have to. Yeah, so we kind of have to because everyone else, everyone's doing it and it's just people like to do it. Also, it's cheaper to do on the legal side, especially at startup level, you know, they don't have much capital for legal. So it is cheaper to do that. Um, why it's not a great product, two reasons. Number one is founders like to use it, but they don't realize if you stack convertible note, convertible note, and convertible on top of each other, eventually when it converts, and if, it can, if, you don't, if you're not careful, it can smush a founder. There's plenty of times where we've seen a bunch of convertible notes exercise and the founder goes from owning a majority to owning a minority just because of various triggers that has happened. Um, and the nice thing about doing direct equity is that it's very clean and simple. I know I own X. Mm -hmm. I very easy for you to tell me that the next round of share price is $4 a share. And I can tell what my valuation is. And it's just 
doesn't cause any of these questions as to like, how much do I really own in this business based on traction or any, any of these other factors that, that are happening? And look, obviously, when you look at public companies, when I can see the multiples and the revenue, like I can imply what the valuation of my holdings are at any point. Convertible notes, again, makes it ambiguous because then how does it all convert correctly? What percentage do I own? Things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Thank you for giving that uh, that um, insight. Um, and this has been extremely valuable. Um, I know we only have five minutes left, so I want to do two things. One, just open it up to anybody in the audience, again, that might have a question or a comment. Please keep it in the chat. I'm, I'm looking at it right now, so let me know. And But then also just kind of give you an opportunity, Michael, to give any, uh, you know, closing remarks, um, anything that you want to elaborate on or something you think that our listeners might find valuable um, that you could share with us in closing? Sure. So like I mentioned before, I think it's imperative that, you know, everyone understand that this is a two-way relationship with founders and VC. So the more intel you provide us either just around your business or around the sector, I think is imperative, like sending me an extra report or sending me cool founders that I should know. I think that is helpful for us to build that relationship. Another thing um, I think is important is look, it is very, it is free to create blog posts and write reports on LinkedIn or wherever about whatever seg segment you, you are in, right? And as a founder, you want to be that like source of truth, source of knowledge about, you know, whatever vertical, whatever vertical your business is in. And when I know that you know everything about robotics, when I come to approach you potentially, or you approach me, I can look you up and be like, holy moly, this guy knows everything and everyone in the robotic space or in whatever category you're in. And it just makes me feel like you are that industry expert that if I wanted to make a bet in that vertical, I'm making the bet on the right guy because you know he's that smart person. So don't be afraid to share your ideas, right or wrong. You know, the internet will let you know, but share your ideas, you know, build up that network, build up that like audience that will make you, you know, that kind of that de facto, you know the guy in or the gal in whatever seg segment or sector. Yeah, that's, that's super great. Um, and uh, Jason um, had posted in the chat and asked if you could maybe dig a little more into what type of traction experience you're looking for with your investments. What do you, what types of, uh, what type of traction and experience uh, specifically? Sure. So, I mean, obviously with founders, we run the gamut of someone who just graduated or even drop out of high school to someone that worked 10 plus years in whatever category it runs. So founder experience isn't that important because again, we've had cases where founder had no experience at all and created a, you know, a unicorn and we have founders where they have all the experience in the world and their business went dud after six months. Right. So founders, like as long as you are truthful and honest and open with us, it makes us, you know, feel comfortable about that. Again, part of having a nice deck and you know, knowing your stuff is, makes us feel good. Um, in terms of traction, it varies, but at the seed level, we typically like to see about 25-ish thousand a month in MRR or some type of revenue traction, a real revenue traction where we can like, feel comfortable about making that initial investment or, or taking that initial deeper dive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So having some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of revenue being generated uh, on a recurring basis is really kind of the barometer for you. It gives it a little more uh, credibility and something to, to point to and build off of. Um, so that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, uh, I know we're, we're up on our time here. So a um, couple of thank yous, uh, Gina, thank you so much for being here you, and helping. Yeah. Um, thank you, you guys. Yeah, and I wanted to also just thank um, uh, First Republic and Trinet, and then of course WaveMaker, uh, Michael. I know that your time is very valuable, so no, no, my pleasure. Here, it means a lot. So thank you very much. And thank you, David, for being an amazing host and uh, you know moderator. You are fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and again, you guys, apologies so much for the little the little hiccup. You gotta love technology, right? You think it was a Monday and Zoom had Monday brain, but either way, we'll get both of these up on the website for you. We'll email everyone with follow-up questions. And then, like we said, if you guys, you know, Michael is the best way you gave your email, right? So Michael at wavemaker.vc. Perfect. And then David, if you want to give yours, you know, if you want to reach out to either of these guys or have any other questions, you know, please reach out and we're here for you. And with that, we wish everyone happy holidays and we say goodbye. Happy New Year. Everybody. Take care. Bye guys. Right. Thank you guys.